Welcome in. It's another edition of ACC Baseball Etc., part of the D1 Baseball Podcast Network, and our first of 14 conversations with the 14 head coaches in the Atlantic Coast Conference as we ramp up to the 2024 season. Uh, ACC Baseball Etc. is presented by Pitch Logic, the system used by players, coaches, scouts, and instructors at all levels of play, from youth leagues to the big leagues. The easy to use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features used at the highest level, you can go to pitchlogic.com for more information. Uh, you know me, I'm Darren Vaught. Glad you're with us. Our first coaches conversation of this preseason belongs to the 2022 ACC Coach of the Year. I'm, of course, talking about John Sheff, the head coach, uh, entering season number seven with the Virginia Tech Hokies. John, good to see you, man. I, I, I trust that the holidays treated you well and, and everything's everything's good on, on your end. Yep. No, it's good, man. We're uh, just kind of getting ready to go here, getting ready to ramp up um, when the guys come back um, soon and um, just kind of planning. And, you know, it's just typical for this time of the year, I'd say. Do you, do you like this time of year or, or are you just like you're just ready to get six weeks ahead? Um, I like is, a, is an interesting word there uh, just because there's, there's so much going on. Um, and you really have to be patient because when guys come back here, you know, they're not going to be in midseason form. Uh, they'll be in some kind of form, but it won't be what you through. Um, and um, you just got to it, – it always does interest me, though, to see how guys do come back because they all go, they all go out with a plan. And, you know, as a coach, you expect them to execute their plan, you know, weight training-wise and baseball-wise. And typically, most guys will not be the same when they come back. Uh, in a lot of cases, guys are further along, and in some cases, they're behind because maybe they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, but, you know, in recent past, we, we've been in a pretty good place with guys coming back more advanced when they left. And that's kind of what you hope for, I think. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> I, I would imagine a, a lot of those goals and plans are sort of individualized in some cases, depending on what what occurred in the fall, um, yep. what yep. the progress guys made in the fall. Is there a player that jumps out in your time there, or maybe back at, at Maryland, like somebody that, that jumps out as coming back almost a you know, I, this might be an exaggeration, but you, you they get back for the spring season. You're like, whoa, who's this guy? Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, there's there's been a lot of guys that uh, that are better when they come back. Most guys are. As far as that that amount, uh, there's probably the only guy. Well, the one guy, the first guy that would kind of jump out to me was a guy we had here, uh, Tanner Schobel, played shortstop for us and was a second-round pick there in 22. Um, I really wasn't sure, like, how ready he was going to be uh, to play right out of the gate as a freshman. And, like, he had a really good fall that year. That was the fall of 21. I'm sorry, the fall of 20. Yeah, because he missed the senior year because of COVID. And um, I'm talking about his freshman year. And yeah. he came back after that break in the spring of 21. And, you know, he was going to play second base. And that was the plan. And about a month in, he was way better than that. Like, he was just way more advanced than – like, he got really, really good faster than just about anybody I've been around. And it carried mm -hmm. right into that spring, and then it carried into the next spring, and – you might see that guy in Minnesota at some point soon here, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. No doubt. Um, you guys, it, it, I was sort of gathering some stuff to, to, for our conversation and it occurred to me, man, you guys had a uh, kind of a fun off season um, in the sense that fall ball had some interesting elements with the game against Tennessee, the, the, what the hokey smoky classic as you guys called it, which is a, yeah. a really cool opportunity. 
Uh, yeah. You guys had a, 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 a member of your Virginia Tech baseball family start a World Series game with Joe Mantiply. Yeah. Like there's just yeah. there's there's this this uh, several layers of things that that we need to get into because again it's just it's been a fun stretch for for the Hokies program. Um, yeah. Let's start with Joe, right? Like I know he yeah. he didn't play for you there at Virginia Tech, but he's right. he's part of right. the family, part of the program. What was oh, that yeah. like? Sort of yeah. following along with that. Well, when, when I was at Maryland, my first year at Maryland in the spring of 13, that was his last year here. And we, Maryland was in the ACC at that point, so we faced him at one point, as well as uh, uh, Chad Pender on that, third, that really good 13 team they had here. And, uh, man, that was, that was not good, you know, facing Joe as, as an opposing team. Uh, that whole team they had in 13 was really good, but Joe was pretty special, you know, and you know, give him credit, man. He's done a he's done a great job as far as he's played for you know a few different teams, and he's a survivor. Like he's just keep he keeps rising through, and and, and, and every spring he's in the middle of, of the roster, you know, in the middle of the pitching staff. And, and uh, the other thing I would say about so this past to add to your off season interesting things that you just brought up in November. I asked him and uh, Chad Pender, who are good friends, and are like Virginia Tech Hokies to the to the core, uh, if they'd come in and talk to our guys, um, just about the mental side of things in the game. You know, dealing with the ups and downs of it, dealing with the failure of it. And now here you have two former players, both big leaguers. Joe's a pitcher. This is probably maybe a month after he started that World Series game. And he, and, and he lives in Virginia in the off season, and and um, and Chad, who had just retired, you know, position player, and so they came in. It was like a little round table we had with the players, and it was great, man. Those guys were just, you know, they're just really good at getting into that one topic. That's a really, you know, it can be a difficult topic um, for coaches and players to handle. You know, you can talk about it, you can have a strategy, and then all of a sudden when things go south, then then you see how good your strategy is. And so those guys were very helpful to our guys, and they've been that way as long as I've been here. Um, and you know, and it's, I guess maybe the last thing I take like about Joe is like as as big as he's become, starting a World Series game, as big as Chad, you know, had become, you know, playing for X amount of years in the big leagues. Um, those guys have never been like too big to come back here and help us out, you know. Um, so I'm really thankful for that. And, I mean, it's, it is, yeah, it is really cool, you know, having the fact that Joe had just started a World Series game. But if you sat and talked with him, you'd be like, you wouldn't even know that this guy, you know, did that. Uh, he, he's about as average a, average a Joe guy as there is, no pun intended, you know. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's so crucial. For, for you guys as coaches, I would imagine, to yeah. not only have that success out of alums, but the like you're talking about the the willingness, the the want to come back and help in that way. Cause I mean, you know, let's face it, not everybody's that way. They kind of get done with their college days and they move on and and right. that's that, right? I'm sure they're appreciative in in yeah. most cases, more often than not, but yeah. um it's it's yeah. not it, not that it's an exception to the rule. I would say it's probably more common than not, but it, it's nice to have guys who are, are able and willing to come back and, and help out. And, 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 and again, in this case, guys that you didn't coach there, you coached against them. Oh yeah. No, that's, 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 that's the other thing is that, you know, sometimes when you don't coach guys, you know, you don't really know exactly what the relationship's going to be at times. Um, you know, and understandably so. I mean, you know, those guys played for Pete Hughes, and, and they had a great relationship. I'm sure they still do with Pete, and Pete's a good dude, man. I mean, great coach in his own right. Um, but, uh, again, those guys are just they, – I think they really enjoy Virginia Tech, and they have – you know, Chad grew up in, in Virginia, so, you know, Joe's Virginia native, and those guys just never got – have never really gotten too far away from it, I don't think. So. Yeah. Um, the, the, maybe the only thing I've got in common with those guys, John, mm -hmm. yeah. Virginia guy, I grew up yeah. about 
30 miles from where you're sitting there in Blacksburg. And yeah. my first college baseball game as a fan, as a spectator, as a kid, right. was at English Field. Really? Now, I, I am fascinated with the progress that that facility has made. And yeah. you guys continue to do more and more with it. Um, what we can you tell this, us about what's what's happened to this offseason? I know new turf and, and all kinds of stuff happening there with the facility. Yeah, well, it started right about the time I got here. You know, our, our athletic director, Whit Babcock, and, um, you know, John Bolin and our administration kind of put together the idea to redo the facility. Because at the time, you know, I thought I, I had come here uh, when I was in Maryland as an opposing coach. And I, I thought it was pretty good, you know, but it wasn't, you know, in the top – top third of the ACC for sure at the time. And, you know, we played college baseball at JMU. His dad was the head coach there. And and so they, I mean, I think to Witt's core, he's a baseball guy. He was on the NCAA baseball committee um, recently. And so they, they put this plan in place to kind of redo the stadium here. And once, you know, so that happened. They they redid the Weaver facility down the left field line, which the bottom floor of that used to be a storage garage, and they turned that in. It's a clubhouse. It's a trainer's facility, a team room. You know, we do all of our video stuff in there. Um, one thing leads to another, and then we get a nice donation, private donation. We put a pitching lab in, which opened last March. Um, and it's not just an indoor bullpen. It's, it's, you know, you got all the technology that, that pitchers would want to develop. And, um, and then within the last 12 months, we've had the LED lights put in and just fit the, they're literally just finishing the turf projects here as I speak. Um, it'll be ready uh, for when we start practice here. Cause that turf that we were playing on was older. That turf is the same turf that man apply and Pender played on, uh, in 13. So it was, it was a little outdated, um, especially now with all the summer baseball is played on it. So there's been a lot of things that have happened here um, to improve this facility, to put it into the top third of the ACC, I think. And, you know, as you win and as you have success and the ballpark fills up for games, that's when it gets pretty cool, I think, because now not only is the facility good, but you have people that are in it, a lot of people. You know, thousands of people that want to come watch college baseball. And so, you know, we've been lucky enough to have that here. Uh, I mean, the fan supports, it's it's first rate. I mean, if you go to a football game, a basketball game, whatever sport you're talking about, you know, people take a lot of pride in watching uh, different sports here. And baseball is just, you know, is, is one of them. And um, so I just feel really fortunate about that, that the facilities works at. We've been able to get good players in here. And um, and really just kind of elevate things uh, accordingly, you know. So not that they weren't good in the past. I mean, they hosted a re- you know Chad and Joe and and um, and Pete hosted a regional here in thirteen. So you know we got back to that last in twenty two, and you know last year had a fight through a ton of injuries and, and feel like we're in a pretty good spot this year. So yeah, well, I guess that that's a good segue into. This is a, a season preview conversation for, for yeah. all intents and purposes. So yep. Um, yep. what did you discover about your team that maybe you weren't quite sure about? Uh, what, what stood out from, from the fall? And, and maybe you can specifically note the, the, the Tennessee game in, in Greenville, Tennessee there, if that had anything to do with it. Um, what, did, what did you learn, I guess, is the simplest way to put that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, we have a very – our pitching staff is very new. It's very similar to what our situation was in 22. We don't return a whole bunch of ACC starting experience. And so I was, I was kind of concerned where, you know, you got a lot of new faces there. And, you know, now with guys transferring, you have a lot of transfer guys. Not a lot, but maybe we got eight, you know. So maybe people might think that's a lot. But we also lost a lot of pitching off that staff last year. So I wasn't quite sure how that was going to go, how that was going to kind of match up. But um, what I didn't quite realize that of those guys that came in and, you know, we have some pretty high level freshmen that came in too, was that, you know, you got some pretty hungry guys and, the, and, the, and that they're very coachable. Sometimes when you deal with uh, older uh, guys, transfer guys that have played in other programs, sometimes it's not that way. Um, but it is with this group. 
And this group, like the blend of returning players and these new guys have been a very good blend, a lot better than maybe I, I, I don't know what I anticipated, but I, I think the blend has been good. Um, it's, it's a very, very similar situation where we were at the beginning of the 22 season. We had little or no experience that year either. Um, like nobody knew who Drew Hackenberg even was. The guy didn't yeah. pitch well. They had no idea what that guy was going to be. I didn't need, I, I didn't know. And, uh, you know, two years later, he was the second round pick of the Braves, you know, and, and kind of was a big part of that program having this, that team having the success it had in 22. Griffin Green was another guy, uh, had made zero ACC starts. And all of a sudden, this guy could handle pitching on Friday night in the ACC. Uh, I, I don't know that we saw that one coming either. And to his credit, he did a great job of that. So that's, those are just two examples of kind of where we were in 22. We have very similar situations this year. Um, I'm not saying this is the 22 team. I'm just saying the situation is similar. That's all. Uh, we return our whole infield from last year, a couple outfielders, a couple catchers, uh, have a couple, you know, very interesting new players. So, like, you know, we might not be getting a lot of the hype and all some of the love that some of these other programs are getting right now, which is fine. I, I don't, it doesn't bother me really. Um, I'm just very eager to get out and start playing games with this group. Um, lastly, I think what you had brought up about the game in Greenville against Tennessee, I thought like my hope there was that we go, we go to Tennessee, we play a really good team. Uh, we traveled three hours to get there. You play a long day, you travel three hours back. Like that was a marathon of a day. You play in front of a lot of people. Uh, you're really out of your comfort zone. You're playing on dirt. We hadn't been on dirt the whole time. We hadn't been away from Blacksburg the whole time. So that was a major, majorly uncomfortable day, uh, which is important to push your guys to, to get to get them in those situations early on. And, and you're playing a really good team. I mean, Tony's got a really good team. Those guys are good, man, like from, from top to bottom. Um, and, and I felt like we got out of that day what we wanted to. We got a lot of good experience. We put some new players in situations where we could learn about them and they could they could learn about hey you want to play high level division one baseball this is it man right here you know um and i think we came away from that uh way better uh you know it, it was the same thing we played georgetown here and then our fall world series is beneficial but uh yeah that that, that day in, in greenville was really good for us and um but i did the one thing that i would that i learned about our team probably in the fall was that the new players, uh, the blend of the new and the returning was a way better blend than I maybe had, an, and maybe had anticipated it being. Not physically, not talent-wise, but how they got along, how they worked together, how they could relate with each other. And, like, I think we, like, we have good enough players to be really, really good. Um, but, you know, they, they also have to be able to get along, uh, work with each other, deal with each other when things are not good. And this group was able to do that. So uh, hopefully that will carry into the spring. And, and I think it will be a, a – you know, that that's a really good starting point for us. Yeah. Um, I, I I tend to – get you know get kind of kind of big picture philosophical on coaching stuff when uh, you mention things like that. Yeah. How, how much of that can you actually control? as a head coach, as, as recruiters, uh, and a staff or, or control is not the right word. Um, maybe I'm looking for how much of that can you actually anticipate or is it the same kind of anxiety every year? You don't know until you, you clump all the guys together, how they're going to mesh and how they're going to get. Well, up. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, like on paper, the team we had last year in 23 was probably better on paper than the team we had in 22. It's better. It's on paper. It's probably a little bit better than the team we have right now, only from an experience perspective. But does it really matter? It really doesn't matter because you're not winning. You don't win anything on paper, you know. Uh, I, and when I say that, I'm, I'm only saying it just from an experience perspective. Like that team last year was a little bit more experienced than the 22 or this team we have right now. How much of that can you, can you control? I think you can. can I mean, you can't control everything, but I think you can aid to 
the group getting along in, in what I've found over the years and what you do off the field, like what you, what you arrange for them to do off the field, away from baseball, um, socially together in different situations. Um, for instance, uh, each one of the last five falls, maybe probably since we've been here, we've had one afternoon in the fall where we take these guys out and they, they play a uh, paintball. You know, like I never played that in my life, you know, and it, but these guys, they really enjoy it. You know, you talk about like a bonding kind of thing, like that's, it's a good thing. Um, so that's one example of that. On the other side of it, I think one way that you can help to aid that is from a coaching perspective, like, you know, you obviously have high standards for what's going to happen on the field, but you also don't, you don't make things a pressure cooker every day. You know, where where everyone's tight as a drum when they go out there. Like it can't be that way. You know, you're together a long for a long time, many hours. And you, you want to try to make it as good a working environment as possible on the field, off the field, in the weight room, everything else. Um, not that guys don't know that that they don't have to perform and get their jobs done and because they, they they know that. I mean if they don't know that, they're probably in the wrong place anyway, you know. But I think as a coaching staff, if if you make it a pressure cooker and if it's a yelling, screaming environment, it's not good, man. Like it's not um, it's not it's not going to help progress. Usually, when people are very anxious and nervous and tight when they're doing whatever job they got to do, they probably don't do it as well. Uh, but if they have some kind of if they're in some kind of relaxed mode where they can concentrate and, and kind of fall back on their training and, and, and basically be able to operate. That's kind of the word I use a lot. Like if, if you can, if we can just kind of slow some things down and breathe and operate, um, we'll be fine. And so that's, that's kind of what we try to create as best as possible uh, as our, our staff. I'm, I'm really lucky. Our staff is, is kind of an older veteran staff. We've been together now for, six years for the most part. Um, and, you know, we got a couple additions around COVID, which have really helped us. But, um, you know, it's, it's, we just try to create a good, relaxed working environment each day and, and feel like our guys make progress that way. Yeah. Um, this is, this is going to be a question about you. I love that answer. It's a great answer. There's a lot of experience wrapped up into that answer. Right. How differently would you have answered that question, say, 14, 15 years ago? <laughs> yeah, probably a lot. Probably, um, probably differently. I, how much? I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, over the years, you I mean, I've been a head coach in three different places, been an assistant in three different places. So you work with a lot of guys. You coach a lot of different guys. You kind of take away from people. In programs what you like and maybe you leave behind what you don't like and you just try to you know try to make it the best situation you can what i've learned over the years is that um i'm going to try to put together the best situation for our players that i can put together with our coaching staff are we going to make all the right decisions probably not um we'll make some good ones we'll probably make some not so good ones but it'll probably be somewhere in the middle and um you know, that's kind of that's kind of what we do. But like, I've tried to just trust what the years have given me a little bit um, and not try to be somebody that I'm not like everybody's got their different their different characteristics that makes them successful. Right. We have a really have a ton of good coaches in this league that are that are very different kinds of people and what they do makes them successful. And, and I think they probably trust what they do. I would say if you sat down with Brian up at UVA, he'd probably tell you the same thing, you know, uh, and, or, or, or Chris at Duke or any one of, you know, Elliot. I mean, Elliot and, and Danny Hall probably have more experience than anybody in this league do. And, and they haven't been successful over the years because they make a lot of bad decisions. Those guys make a lot of really good decisions. But they probably would take a couple back if, if you asked them, you know. So that's kind of it's there's really no like spe- secret sauce to it I don't think. You're just trying to get the best players you can and 
and put them in situations that are that they're going to be successful and, and, and try to surround yourself with a coaching staff, you know, weight training people, trainers that that um, that have experience. And, and you also let them do their jobs, too. Like if the one thing I would tell you this is I really try not to do over the years. Like I don't sit there and micromanage people, hang over their shoulders and say, do this, do that. I mean, we obviously know everything that's going on. But, you know, I think you get you got to hire good people and trust trust what they do. Um, and give them an opportunity to work and do their jobs. So, yeah, that, that's I don't uh, know, that's probably one, one winded answer there. No, that's all great stuff, man. I I love it. Um, I, I'm I'm going to get into something else coaching wise here. This is a little bit different and a little more pertaining to what's between the line. Yeah, um, two home runs per game. That's what your team has hit mm-hmm. over the past two seasons. Mm-hmm. That is fourth nationally, tops in the ACC for both the 2022 and 2023 seasons. Right. I don't like I don't expect the 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 hammer and hokies to 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 go anywhere, right? I, I I would expect that that's still going to be part of of this team's makeup. Right. But the question for you there John is is how much of that how much of that in a given season for you is I think we've got a team that's got a lot of pop and this is the way that we could best do damage. So I'm going to coach to this and how much of it is just a general philosophy thing where you're sort of coach coaching to hit a, a lot of home runs um, to whatever degree you can. What's the balance there, especially again, coming off of, you know, 22 and 23 where they were, they were teams that were just, they just had a tendency, a propensity to, to hit the yeah. big fly. Well, I, I think uh, I give Kurt and uh, Kurt Elvin and Tyler Hansen, you know, a lot of credit for, you know, Tyson Peterson for kind of preparing guys to 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 slug. I don't know that it's really home runs as much as it's we're just trying to we're trying to hit as many balls hard as possible. We're trying to slug a little bit, you know. I mean, typically it's hard to score in this league with single, 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 single. Um, unless you just have plus runners that can steal bases and go first and third, which I kind of feel like we got some guys that can do some of that too. Um, uh, I think it's more of just, it's more of just kind of working with guys to, to hit balls hard, to be physical and to slug. And, and when you get balls in the air, things can happen, you know, especially in our ballpark where the wind's blowing out the left and off a lot. And if you get balls up in that air on warm days, it, you can go, quick it can it can really multiply you know um but i think where it starts is just getting guys who are good hitters um that are gonna um that are gonna put balls in play with 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 a lot of exit velo not that i'm all about the modern metrics or anything like that but that is that is a pretty important metric when you're talking about hitting and when you get them here, you kind of train them. You get them bigger, faster, stronger through the weight training process, and you you hopefully train them um, to to put balls in play on on, on a regular basis. To have tough at bats, uh, be tougher to strike out. But when they get an advantage counts, you know, which is pretty much anything that's not two strikes, they're not going to cut their swing down. Um, and, and just play pepper and put the ball in play when they're, when they're not in two strike counts, you know, they're trying to do some damage and try to hit for extra bases a little bit and get in scoring position. And I mean, the bottom line, we're trying to build big innings. We're trying to build the three run inning and, and typically uh, parts of the three run inning to go back to my Tony Robo show days is, 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 is an error, a, a hit by a pitch or a walk, but there's also nowadays, there's also some slug in there too. You're not usually going to put together three run innings with single, single, single. It could be a single, one of the things I mentioned, and maybe a double or triple or, or a home run. Um, and I, lastly, I just think we have enough. We've had enough good players offensively to operate that way. It's not like we've been dealing with subpar hitters. We've been dealing with guys that can handle it. And it's more than just nine guys. Usually, there's probably two or three or four guys on the bench that can very easily be in that nine. But maybe on that day the matchup says somebody else is better. You know, it's a better matchup that day. So, 
Um, I, I want to get into some specific, some guys and and yeah. such about this team. Carson Demartini just yeah. uh, within a day or so ago was named uh, preseason All American um, by by one outlet. I'm sure there are going to be more to come. Uh, yeah. He's been a big part of your program the past few years. Um, yep. I'm just naming returners that that seem to me like they're going to be have a big impact, right? Chris Canazaro right. is back. Yep. Uh, Eddie Isert is a guy who seemed like, especially in the last what few weeks of the season last year, he just he just sort of um, blew yeah. up. He's uh, felt like I saw, it felt like I saw a a, a, a video highlight of a, an Eddie home run like every other day for a stretch there. Um, right. Who who else? Who else is back that, that you expect big things out of? And if you would, just speak to those guys and, and their their place. Well, I mean, I think outside of what you just meant, I mean, obviously, you know, Dean Martini is a pretty easy one to, to you know, kind of be the face of maybe our, our offense, if not our team in general. Um, but, you know, obviously, Iser and Canizero, you know, Chris had a real good year last year coming in here from Bucknell. And, um I think there's a there's probably a few other guys, Christian Martin, our, our second baseman, left handed second baseman, had a really good summer in the Cape, and I think he hit like almost three forty four last year. Like he, he's a pretty quality player, man. Like a quality hitter, very consistent defender, can turn a double play. Um, uh, our shortstop Clay Grady, you know, you know uh, won the job last year, and she, you know, is back as a sophomore. Uh, we have a lot of left-hand hitters and a guy like Grady, right-hand hitter, and Canizero. They can kind of break those guys up a little bit. And Clay's probably our fastest base runner, can handle it defensively, and just plays way above the level that you might expect. Um, he's just he's just a quality defender, quality hitter. He's probably tough a kid as we've had here. Uh, the one guy that I would tell you that really had a, a great fall, and I will say great because it was a great fall. He's been in the program for a while, um, had a great summer, Sam Tackett. People probably do not know who this guy is because he didn't play on a regular basis for us the last few years. Right-hand hitter, corner outfielder. Um, he might be one of our better players right now. Uh, that's probably a name to watch moving forward that many people might not know. Um, uh, talented player, good outfielder. When you talk going back to the, the topic of slug, uh, yeah. this guy will slug as much as anybody in our lineup, most likely. Did in the fall. Uh, played a little bit in Cape this summer. Led the New England Collegiate League in, in home runs and RBIs. Um and I give him a lot of credit. He's got a lot of have had a lot. He's had a lot of patience. He's played behind people here over the years, last couple of years, and like kind of has been patient in getting his opportunity. Where a lot of guys aren't that way. Like if it doesn't go their way right out of the gate, man, they're gone, or or they're you know they're getting mishandled. And he's very patient. He's going to graduate this spring. He has a year left of eligibility, but Sam Tackett will be a good player this spring for us. Very good player. Um, and we have a few different, uh, a couple guys come back on the catching side. Uh, Gary Giebel is a senior. Henry Cook is a sophomore. We have a freshman, David McCann. You know, a lot of names that are like maybe not household names just yet. That'll be very good players for us that maybe people don't know. The, the last guy I would tell you who had a, another really good summer in the Cape and playing for Bourne was Garrett Michelle, our first baseman. Um, yeah. Physical guy, fits into the mode that you talked about as far as slugging and getting balls in the air. Like fits into our ballpark really well. Um, it should hit right in the meat of the lineup as he did last year. And um, another good quality left-handed hitter for us there. Yeah, I man, it it I knew you guys had a lot of position players back this yeah. year. But yep. as you list them off, I had – I think I had you guys once. I called the series at Duke. Mm -hmm. um, and even even then, I remember we talked beforehand about a guy like Clay at shortstop, and you sort of yep. at the time yep. were you put us on, and you were like, "Hey, he's a, he's a really good player all, yeah. all around, can defend well, and he made a yep. couple of great plays in that series." Um, yeah, so that's, yeah he, man, that's encouraging he, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, I think we have a, a good nucleus of guys returning 
uh, from last year position player wise. Uh, it's very similar, very similar to 22. I'm telling you, uh, at the time, like people, you know, you weren't maybe expecting this huge year out of a catcher like Kate Hunter. Um, I can tell you, I love Gavin Cross to death. He really made his mark here. But if you'd have told me in January of 22 that that guy was going to be a first rounder, uh, man, a first rounder, like a high first rounder too, you know, and, and give him credit. Like he, he earned every bit of that and was, was, uh, was tremendous and still is. And he'll be a big leader. But like, I don't know that we saw that one coming, you know, um, uh, in addition to uh, the pitching that I talked about before. Uh, I mean, I think we all kind of knew Shoba was going to be really good. You know, a second rounder, ugh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I, I probably at the time, I, maybe I wouldn't have said uh, D. Martini would have been a freshman All-American either. I knew he was really good, but, I mean, you know, before a guy has one college at bat, you don't really know exactly what it's going to be, you know. So, but, um, you know, that, that team, a lot of guys played up on that team. Um, and I think that'll be a pretty similar situation this year, I think, you know, so. Yeah. No, I, I think even even from a – from like a uh, – a pro scouting perspective, even when when Gav, Gavin sort of came to be what he was for you guys, e- yeah. even then the jury was still kind of out. So I I, I do collegiate national team games, and right, obviously right. we did the the Appalachian League barnstorming thing. Yeah, and he, he blew up that summer, and oh, it was yeah. funny to get to know him during that stretch, John, because yeah. he, he's from Bristol. I'm from close by. Like I grew up going to Appy League games and right, everybody right. else on the bus was kind of like, man, where are we? What are these places? Right. And, yeah. and yeah. they were giving, they were giving him a, a little bit of hell for it, but um, yeah. that's what made it fun to sort of get to know him then. Cause I was like, Hey man, same, I get it. Like they, they're just, they're just not, I'm just, I'm just the broadcaster. So they're not, they're not, uh, Talking right. to me the same way about it, and yeah, um, I'm not taking it away from Gavin. I mean, he, he Gavin's about as good a hitter as I've ever been around in my life. I mean, he's he's yeah. as good a player, but like he he, you know, you're talking about a guy he wasn't drafted out of high school, right? Um, missed missed a good like his freshman year was COVID, so he only played 15 games. You know, like he in theory he played college baseball for two years and went from being a non-drafted high school guy to the ninth pick in the first round. Like, that's a dramatic rise. And to his yeah. credit, you know, like, he, he accomplished that. And I think a lot of it was, to your point, what he did that summer for Team USA. And then he kind of brought it here his, his junior year and, and led that team to, to what happened here in 22. So, like, I mean, Gavin Cross is probably a monstrous face of the success of this program. Uh, my, my only point was – just to mention, we had a lot of guys on that 22 team that were very, very good players. But if you go back to January of 22, two years ago, you might you might have been like, man, I know this guy's going to be really good, but I'm not quite sure how good. That's all. you know. So, and yeah. He, yeah he and, it fits that category. Yeah. yeah. A great player, but but emblematic of how quickly it can happen for a kid yeah right oh, yeah. Or, or several right as you're talking about it just sort of all comes together so um again that that is what makes i think your squad this year particularly encouraging um let me ask you this on on the way out john um pitching wise what needs to happen for you you know and i'm not i'm not putting you on the record for yeah we're gonna win 45 games and make a super regional but yeah if if this is gonna be a team that becomes ultimately pretty similar to 22. What, what do you yep. need out of pitching for that to happen? I just think we need a lot of guys to, to be good in their roles. That's all. Uh, I can't really tell you, you know, this guy's going to be your Friday night guy. That guy's going to be your Saturday guy. Like some, maybe some of the other guys in our league can right now. I do think we'll have, we have a lot of really good pieces and, and where they shake into We'll find out probably in the next three to four weeks as far as how the season is going to start. Uh, but again, if I go back two years ago and we got Drew Hackenberg on our team, I don't know what that guy's really going to be. But to his credit, he earned everything. Like he, you know, we were kind of toying with should we start him the first weekend that year against UNC Asheville? Like, or should we bring him in behind somebody? 
and and we ended up starting him. I, you know, I give uh, our staff uh, credit for making that decision. They started him, and it was all history from there, you know. And I think we have a lot of really interesting young guys and new guys, and I'm really eager to watch them go out and do their thing. But what what we need to have happen is those guys just to be – don't feel like anyone's got to be the guy. We just need guys to, to – be really good in their roles. I do think one thing that needs them. I think we need a lot of guys to throw a lot of strikes. If we throw strikes and play defense and not give away a lot of free bases. I think we're going to be really good because we're going to score a lot of runs. And our defense with a full returning uh, infield from last year and, and veteran catching will be good. But if you give away a lot of free bases and ball, 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 it's hard to defend that for anybody, not, not necessarily yeah. just us. But I think if we have guys perform well in their roles, throw a lot of strikes, attack the strike zone, and just not try to be, you know, much more than 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 the good solid players that they are, we'll be just fine. And that's exactly yeah. the way it was two years ago. I'm telling you, same thing. Uh, again, I, <laughs> I'm encouraged. Like right. <laughs> I wish it was more exciting. I I, I don't really have like this, this stick of dynamite to throw out there. You know what I mean? But, that's it. No, but that's what makes this time of year fun and interesting, right? And and oh, yeah. you know, everybody's you might not like it as we as we started with that, but um, yeah, it, it makes it interesting, right? Because every coach is going through a a different. Yeah, version everybody's of optimistic what you're this time of year as they should be, and you know, I mean, the one the last thing I would tell you is like the one thing that I, has helped us through the years is having healthy players. Yeah, you know, the greatest oh, yeah. ability is availability, as uh, as uh, my guy Kurt Elvin would say. You know, you, you got to keep guys on the field, and uh, we kind of struggled with that last year, but um, and we didn't struggle with that in twenty two. And sometimes you can't control that, um, and a lot of the times you can't control that. But I think as 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 we have uh, the availability of our our better players, then we'll be in good shape. And again, any coach would tell you the same thing. So. Yeah. Man, it'll be here before we before we know it. What, like five weeks away yeah. from, from opening comes, weekend now? Um, it comes really quick. excited. Uh, I'm excited to see your guys at some point. I don't have schedules yet in terms of seeing teams live and in person, but um, yeah. I'm sure it'll happen at some point, and we'll talk before before then as well. But, uh, yeah. John, appreciate the time, as always. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Really Thanks. excited about your team, um, and best of luck as we, we get things rolling here, all right? Thanks a lot. You have a good day. Thank you. You too, John. Appreciate it. Take care.